All right, so last talk before lunch, so I will try and move along here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about NephroU and, um, you know, actually it's a good lead into our case this afternoon. We have a NephroU, so we will um, talk about both the SI and the XI approach because it's kind of been... As the XI has come on board, it's, it's been a change in how we approach things. So, um, yeah, you know, we start every robotic lecture with the opens the standard, right? So why don't we just say that, get it out of the way, opens the standard. Um, and the idea here is you're going to remove the uh, ureter, the whole ureter, and a cuff of bladder. And, um, and the reason is, of course, is the risk of recurrence is, is higher in the bladder after an FRU. We don't usually take the adrenal out. And then retroperitoneal lymph node dissection is also usually performed. This is kind of a, uh, a carryover from bladder and lymph node dissection in bladder. So we do a lymph node dissection. We're not sure what the benefit of that is, um, but we do it. I do it. Um, we don't sure what it means. And then I will tell you that we're doing more and more new adjuvant chemotherapy. There's some uh, research out of MD Anderson, uh, Serena Matan, showing that patients may benefit with, uh, with chemotherapy with two kidneys as opposed to one kidney. You take out a kidney and they need chemotherapy, the type of chemotherapy you can give is limited. So um, we're giving it pre-op in, in, in many of our patients. The robotic approach to NFRU um, has been explored um, for many years, and this started with the S and then the SI. Um, you really can do a good bladder cuff excision. I think that was one of the criticisms of LAP NFRU, is that you really weren't doing a good bladder cuff, and there were all these minimally invasive crutches and workarounds that, you know, really weren't taken out the bladder cuff, but you could do that robotically. The problem with the robot until, to, until recently is that it required a fair amount of logistical um, activity to, to complete the operation because you were going from the kidney to the bladder and the robot in, in its early form was not good at, at reaching those areas. But there were people that had described single docking, single port configurations, um, and Ashok Kamal actually had done a lot of work um, describing that. But if you really pull him aside and say, okay, you know, I saw your paper, you know, he said, yeah, you can pretty much do it in small women, but anybody with a BMI over 30, you gotta redock. You gotta, you gotta put extra ports in and redock. And that was the reality. And that's, I think that's a reasonable answer. Of course, that wasn't in the, in the publication. But um, so there was the description, but I think really this has all changed with the XI. So this was what I did with the SI. So I actually, I do a little different camera configuration than most. I do I put the camera laterally, but it actually helped out quite nicely for this type of approach because I would do the robot, uh, do the kidney portion with this um, triangle, if you will, and dock, and that would be the direction I was facing. And then I would actually undock, but use the same port configuration, and I would change my, my left arm would stay the left arm, the camera would stay the camera, but my fourth arm in this case would become the right arm, and then I, my direction was down in the pelvis. So this is what I did, it worked, I had to redock, and this is the redocking. So this is the docking for the kidney over the back, and then patients stayed in the same position, I would just bring the robot in front of the legs. And it worked, and we got them done, no additional ports, but we had to redock, and, and we had to redock because it was, you know, these were big men usually. But as we know, the robots changed the S, the SI, now the XI. And one of the features of the XI, which I think really allows you to do this as a single docking approach in large men even, is um, the way the arms have been designed. And there is a function that we were, I was kind of alluding to earlier today in the case, um, we, we call it reach. Um, and reach basically allows the robotic arms to go back on themselves. So, Historically, when you were on the S or the SI, the arms, you could come backwards, you could look down, but then the arm would be on the outside, be hitting itself, and you, could, you, that, you had a limit. What they've done, is they, they've engineered the arm out of its own way. So you can rotate the arm out of its own way, so you can actually get, go back further on yourself. So this is a picture showing the arm in its normal position. There's a picture showing my scrub and what we've done when we've done the reach function. You see how the arm's now out of its own way. What that allows then is the robotic arm to go backwards on itself even farther. What does this mean with regard to range? It means that you gain this extra room backwards. So the ro robot can actually go back on itself quite nicely. And this has benefits in many procedures, but especially the NEF4U. So I, for, for a standard kidney procedure, I use a linear port configuration. I think it works well, six to eight centimeters between. And I put this pretty much on the lateral border of the rectus muscle. 
and I have my assistant in the midline somewhere, and it works quite well. And then you know, just the mirror image um, on the left side, again, using the fourth arm. And the nice thing about the XI, of course, is I don't know how many of you were using the fourth arm with the SI, but there was a fair number of people that found it challenging to get the SI involved. Anyway, um, like to get the fourth arm involved, but with the XI, it's a non-issue. So here's what it looks like in real time on the right, right side, and here's the docking. For the nef you all I'm basically doing is taking that linear configuration and just angling it down. And this angle basically opens up the ports into the pelvis, and that makes all the difference because basically from this port configuration, I can reach from the top of the kidney down to the bladder, and it works quite nicely. My assistant's pretty much the same. And then I dock basically kind of midway between the shoulder and the hip, or right over the hip, or kind of midway between where you want to be working. Um, and it works quite well. And this has worked for all of our, pa our patients transperitoneally. So here's what it looks like in real time. There's our port configuration, um, and that's what it allows us to do. So with this port configuration and the XI, uh, single docking, no additional ports, uh, you can, and, I, and I tend to do the ureter and the bladder cuff first. I think it's nice to do it first because it's under tension. What I do is I will put a clip on, and um, that decreases the amount of spillage. Now, people get excited when you clip the ureter early because they say, oh, the kidney's gonna swell up. We run these patients really dry. Um, I haven't had that problem. I know every time I do that, Ashok Kamal kind of says, oh, you're gonna have a hydronephrotic kidney. I haven't had a problem. We run them dry and we got a pneumoperitoneum going, so the renal blood flow is not significant. And then of course we do the RPL and D as well. So here's kind of what it looks like. Actually, this is a case, you can see SSF on the bottom here. This is their watermark. This is a case we did about three years ago. And this is just showing the first thing I do is find the ureter, clip it, and then there's the iliac, and you can take this down quite nicely. And you can, you can start to see where the bladder becomes wider, you know, where the ureter becomes wider, you're in the detrusor. So I make my hole in the bladder, and then this is a key point. If you cut across the ureter and you don't grab this with a suture, it goes into a hole that you'll never see. And then you don't have a really good closure. You have kind of a, a hole. So sequentially, you take a suture. I usually use a V-lock. Cut, suture, cut, suture. And by doing so, you can really have a nice closure. And you have a handle. That ureter acts as a handle to keep your uh, bladder cuff in view. And it works quite well. And you can usually do a two-layer closure. You just run it one direction, take the same suture, run it back, two-layer closure. And we test it. It's watertight. And we can get the catheter out usually, you know, the next day or two days at most, if, you know, just for edema. So kind of like what Ronnie says, you can do everything in one day. Well, with this, you definitely can get the catheter out in one day if you want, because it's watertight. So let me show you a case. 61-year-old uh, male um, presented with gross hematuria. He did have a bladder tumor, which was T1, uh, high-grade TCC. He underwent a CT scan for part of his staging. And there actually was a tumor in the um, kidney, and it was a kind of a ragged looking tumor with, um, uh, with which was in a duplicated system. So this was um, a duplicated kidney with tumor in the lower moiety of a duplicated kidney, which is interesting. And then we did a biopsy of it, and it turned out to be high grade TCC. Uh, metastatic workup was negative. EGFR was 65. Uh, in renal scan, though, so his good kidney is the right kidney, so he de definitely needs this right kidney. Um, so we actually offered this man um, force of neoadjuvant chemotherapy. He got four cycles of uh, cisplatin and gemcitabine, and his post -chemo, chemo scan shows, you know, kind of a shrinkage in the tumor, but it's stable. There's no progression in his tumor, so that was his post scan. And so based on that, we took him for a right robotic hemi nephroutorectomy. Uh, removal of the upper pole moiety, cystoscopy was performed at the case so we could put a stent in the lower pole moiety so we didn't confuse the two ureters because, you know, how would you know? So we stented the lower pole uh, ureter and then we did the RPL and D. So this is the port configuration, just the mirror image of what I showed on the left side. <coughs> so here we are. So um, mobilizing first the colon and then uh, there's the, the uh, cava, and then there's the two ureters, there's the gonadal above. So I'm clipping the uh, upper pole moiety, the lower pole moiety is stented, um, and so we can see that from, from inside. And then just like I showed you on the, uh, the first video, you can just trace this down. Now the, the issue of course is these are in a common sheath, these two ureters, 
And so you have to be careful as you get down there because there's a blood supply to the other ureter that you'd like not to compromise. Um, but we were able to actually get to the bladder, um, get into the bladder, and then the same concept I showed you previously, make your initial hole in the bladder, get your suture in place, and then you can continue with the excision uh, after you get your suture in. So there's our transected ureter, and then we finish our bladder cuff closure. And again, uh, you know, we haven't had any real issues. This, this um, patient was, you know, normal size, um, BMI of 30, so wasn't obese, but wasn't a small patient, so it worked, you know, quite well with this. So now that we've got the ureter free, we're going up to the hilum, and so we see the main artery. There's a lower pole um, artery and vein. You can see right there, lower pole artery and vein, then there's the main. So what I'm basically doing is just bringing the ureter um, underneath the... Um, underneath the lower pole vessels. And so now we can kind of separate. So we have the lower pole vessels. We're actually clamping the main artery now. We're giving ICG, and we just want to see, to make sure that we got complete ischemia to the upper pole, and we do. So we clamped the main artery, we gave ICG to confirm it, and now we're doing our upper pole hemineferiorectomy. The key here, of course, is you don't want to enter the collecting system. So we used ultrasound, I didn't show that, but we used ultrasound to really delineate where the two collecting systems were in the kidney, because obviously you don't want to enter that if you can avoid that. Bagged our specimen. And then uh, uh, perform our renorophy, which you know we've we've you guys have probably talked about at nausea today. Um, and this is just the outer layer. I like the labratize. I mean you can you can reinforce those with a hemolock, but labratize I think work well. So four hours, patient did well, went home on post step day number two, um, had high grade TCC in the in the kidney. Uh, lymph nodes were negative, and this is the specimen here, so you can see uh, upper pole hemi with the ureter down to the bladder. You had a holster in there, which you had on your first case today as well. Why? So um, in cases where I get bleeding or if I have incomplete ischemia, it's, it's a nice way to tampon out the bleeding while I'm working around. So there have been some cases, and I just do it at, you know, just out of routine. But if I'm doing a, like a large case or whatever, and I'm cutting across and I have bad, you know, bad control, I can actually tamponade and still cut or tamponade and, and suture if I, if I have incomplete ischemia and I can't see well. And the bolster is great for that. I never leave it in the kidney, but it, I think it's a really nice way to stop and create direct pressure. Okay. So the patient did well, no complications, and, and maintained um, significant amounts of GFR. So with that, I'd like to stop, and I think we'll transition to lunch. Um, any questions about anything this morning? Yeah, John. Have you always done the distal cup first? Or did you no, because that's an XI thing. That, that's because I can now. Um, and I do it because you can reach down there immediately. Uh, I could, when, if I started on the kidney like we all did historically, I couldn't reach down there with the SI, so, but now I can. I, I like it, and I'll probably do it today because the, 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 the ureter's under tension. So when you, when you release the kidney, you can, it's no big deal, it's easier, but I, it just seems easier to me to do it, and um, there's, no, there's no harm in doing it so far. So if you were using an SI, would you start it? No, I would be, unless I, unless I put my poor configuration to start in the right. pelvis, I would start on the kidney, and then I would work down like I had done historically, and I'd have to redock with the SI. That's that's what I've found I had to do. I would I, I would do it first on the SI too. I can show you some some port configurations if you want, or you don't necessarily have to redock and get down there unless it's a really really big big person. But I'll show it to you. Yeah. So, um, any questions anymore? So we're going to break for lunch now. I'd like you to, um, we're actually going to have lunch in the fishbowl there, the, the little room. So um, stop by and talk to Scanlon and, and ConMed. They've been great to come and sponsor us. So just, you know, take a look. If you're not familiar with AirSeal, I would really spend some time learning about it. And if you don't have Scanlon Bulldogs, you really should get them because they're really, I mean, we used to, I don't know how many videos you've seen of early pre-Scanlon partial nephrectomies, there were always two bulldogs on the artery, always. Why? Because the closing force of those bulldogs were terrible. Um, you, we've gone away completely from the two bulldog model with Scanlon's. It's one bulldog, it does a great job. So I would, I would definitely talk to them if, you, if you're not familiar with those bulldogs. But we'll have, brec we'll have a lunch and then uh, we'll reconvene at one o'clock for um, a live case. Okay, thank you.